We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, we got, we got one comment on YouTube from last week where we were like, hey man, we were eight seconds short of the two hour mark, so, so couldn't claim the two hour plus club. However... Uh, if you wanted more Tom and Rob, we appeared on uh, DJ's Bright Side Home Theater podcast for more than two hours on that one. So, uh, so there, you, you got oh, your you got your more than two hours. One of us did for Tom sure. I don't know that I was on there for longer than two hours. I don't remember. I mean, it was right about the two hour mark for you, and and uh, we we just decided to use that because after you left, uh, DJ and I went went so far afield that it was. I mean, he was fine with it, but I was like, yeah, I. I that that shouldn't really be released to the public. That was uh, <laughs> that was really not. Rob's not talking about his rashes again. <laughs> <laughs> his rashes and skin lesions. Oh, do is I have the, the monkeypox? Is that what's I, going maybe. on? The, is that the might. new thing? Yeah, monkeypox is here, man. There's cases of monkeypox. It has returned. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Lee is upset on Twitter. He's like, I Lee is always upset. Yes, but shoot. He's like, I, I swear if somebody gives me monkeypox. <laughs> I'm going to send him a monkey picture of a monkey. Yep. Just to, just to aggravate him. He's also losing his crap because he's cut the cord and he's, he's like, this is not the way things are supposed to be. And oh. God, the most curmudgeonly person I have ever known is Lee. It is so strange. I cycle with geriatrics. They're all like eight <laughs> retirees, yeah. right? Yeah. And I don't mean that in any sort of derogatory way. It's just descriptive. Just the age. Yeah. I, I am one of the very few people who are not retired okay. that's, that cycle eight o'clock on a weekday morning. Sure, yeah. Because I can. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, and that's when they do too. During the weekends, it's, it's all ages, but during the week, it's mostly geriatrics. And <laughs> very few of them rise to the level of Lee's <laughs> angst about the world you know and then he buys a tesla and won't shut up about it i'm like dude you're like a walking contradiction you gotta stop it you gotta you gotta just p pick a lane and stay in it you can't just keep hopping lanes like this you can't be oh tesla's the best thing ever and then get off my lawn i want my channels back shut up i mean you can you can, there's but no, then Tom's going to talk about you on this podcast, no, and then here we'll be. No law that says you must be uh, understandably consistent to somebody else's <laughs> logic. So That's yeah. right. It's all about me, Lee. Mm. Okay? I mean, I we can like all this. agree, if, if we could all just get on board, all of us get on board with right. Tom's viewpoint, all problems would be solved. If everyone... This world would be a, a tremendously better place. <laughs> I, cannot, I can't stress and, that enough. And the fact that essentially every individual person uh, feels that way, but about their viewpoint and no one else's... That's true. Um, That's true. It's, That's, uh, but they're, unfortunately they're for them, they're all wrong. They're in I'm the, the only right one. That's right. <laughs> we would be better people. We might not be the best of parents. <laughs> Our children might, come out, might not leave the house the most well-adjusted of people. But... We all we just, would all drive. We would all drive a lot more uh, uh, conscientiously. For sure. And, and we for all sure. end up the sci-fi villain, surrounded by nothing but clones of ourselves. And even then, we're still upset that that we don't all think exactly the same. Yes. <laughs> That's right. So what did you watch this weekend, Rob, or week? Yeah, I, uh, I did actually watch a couple of movies. Um, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because that's not what this podcast is but i did watch her i hadn't uh I, i'd wanted to watch it for that? a long time so that is uh, where did you watch it and can i watch it is the question okay well i watched it on crave so you wouldn't be able to watch uh, it on crave. it might be on hbo max because of that i don't, I don't know if that. i don't actually know if it was warner brothers uh that's joaquin phoenix uh where he falls in love with an artificial intelligence uh which is voiced by scarlett johansson um so i thought it was a very good movie i thought it was very thought-provoking I I really didn't like the ending and not for the reason that other people criticized the ending. I didn't like the ending because the 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 ending ending of the movie like literally the last scene uh felt like a studio note to me. It it didn't feel like it really was the writer's intent. Oh, there wasn't there wasn't ending and the studio guys came in and said 
that's a little too dark or yeah. that's a little too yeah yeah that's oh uh, yeah then people aren't gonna like or it's not testing well yeah I, yeah i, I think that. it was pro it, honestly well. that feels i mean i don't know if this would get but it really feels like that was the case that it was a focus group thing because yeah it was like the whole movie was not cliche and not generic and then the very last thing was like pretty darn cliche <laughs> i was like that right. doesn't that doesn't feel like that was the originally written ending so so unfortunately i felt a little bit let down by the very last scene which is a, a tough thing but otherwise uh very much enjoyed that movie i think it was a remarkable performance by joaquin phoenix because every one of his performances is remarkable it's true, though. but i mean this this one is right because he is alone on screen almost the entire movie and you do not feel like that is what you're watching you feel completely at least i did believed that there was another person i mean i think they they actually had scarlett johansson on set talking to him while they were doing the oh. performance i i think i saw a behind the scenes thing where that was the case but regardless all we're seeing on screen is him and uh and so yeah that, i found that to be a remarkable performance so it's on netflix in the united states in oh, case okay. any of you people are wondering you can watch on Netflix. so definite thumbs up to that one it is very uncomfortable in places even though i watched it alone i'm like yeah i'm glad i'm not watching this one with my parents in places <laughs> it gets really uncomfortable i think that again it's it, it provokes thought and i i find that to be a, a very good beneficial thing not everything was something where i was like oh yeah i can definitely see it going that way you know things i would have disagreed with it, you know in a rewrite or something like that but but that that doesn't matter to me. I'm like, this is what they decided to tell. And and I thought it was really, really well done. Then the other movie that I watched was old. Which uh, one? Uh, so that is the M. Night Shyamalan, They Go to a Beach. Oh, that one. I was thinking old boy when you said sure. old. Yeah. Yes. No, definitely, okay. not, definitely not old boy. Just old. M. Night Shyamalan. Okay. Written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. And I, I tweeted about this because I said, what... what? <laughs> The dialogue was the dialogue written by an AI because that is not how anyone speaks. It is the most, I do not trust the audience to think the question that I want them to think. So, so I will just say it. have somebody say it right mm. out in the absolute worst way. I was, I was bemused and amused by the movie in a way that I know was not intended. Like, you were not supposed to be laughing at the things I was laughing at. And I wasn't laughing because it was well-done right. comedy. I was laughing because I was like, how can it be this bad? How? It had good actors mm, in it. That's too bad. <laughs> it that's was, too bad. I mean, I almost want people to watch it just like, because it's good to watch really badly executed movies sometimes and right. uh yeah it's just just amazing it's, to me <laughs> his career has been so bizarre to me you know because right. he, he started off obviously the sixth sense one of the great movies of yeah. all time he will you will never ever take that away from him and it's, but this is kind of like your first up. if it, it, it does hold up if you Think of like your favorite band. Their very first album mm -hmm. oftentimes is their very best album sure. or one of their very best. Yep. And it's simply because they've had their entire lives up until that moment to pick the best songs that they have created over their entire mm -hmm. lives. And then from that moment on, either they have to take other songs that didn't make the cut for the first album or they have to write new ones that yep. are just as good. That's that's why a lot of times that second album might not be as good. And the third album starts to make a comeback as they start to mature into, you know, you know, songwriting and everything else. I mean, this is just my personal observation. I don't know that there's any objective data that supports the conclusions I've made. But he, I really feel like he has been, uh, he, he is a, a, a victim of his own success. You know, he tried, he's, he's tried so hard to live up to that first movie. Mm. And every subsequent movie has been just, I mean, it hasn't been as good, but it's also tried to be the same thing, if that makes sense. I, I mean, this you one know? this one didn't really have the, the, the you know, twist. The twist. It really it didn't. Well, have, most of really the twists in the last couple of movies have just been like, that's not a twist, that's a plot point. I mean, yeah. it doesn't even, that, everybody saw that coming. So, at, so it's not a twist. At least he, yeah. he got away from that. But I mean, it, it really felt like, like he just has, has not lived amongst humans for many yeah. years. And, and tried to approximate what he remembered of of how a human behaves. It was 
it was bizarre. <laughs> it was really strange. And, it, it, and good grief. I mean, going back to that, what was um he was he did Last Airbender, right? Or just Airbender? Right. He he did or, do the or, Airbender movie, yes. Or, Which I did see yeah. and I cannot remember, but I remember everybody. I have not watched the cartoon. So everybody oh, okay. who watched the cartoon and like straight up hated that movie, yeah, I was well, like I, could see I why. came into it. The cartoon's I came very up, good. Right, and I came. I I've seen a couple of episodes. Uh, I think I started it once or twice with my kids, and then they never really got into it. Which is not because it's not good. It's just I got mm-hmm. bigger things to for, to do than watch cartoons these days. But um, and it just never really caught my attention. But I, you know, I don't I don't remember totally hating that movie. I remember getting getting to the end and going, well, well I mean, I'm, I'm I'm clearly never going to watch this again because okay. it wasn't that good. But no, it wasn't it was like good. it wasn't like the the childhood ruining you know sure. milestone that yeah, everybody I mean, it else was, seems to it think was just it was. completely unnecessary when the cartoon exists because the, yeah. that is so much better but no the b- b- uh, point i wanted to make in relating it to old is just that one of the criticisms the correct criticisms of uh his version of uh airbender was that um just the the camera just the way it was shot was so boring like he would just point the camera somewhere and then the effects weren't really that great and it's like it had no sense of power or movement to these things that were supposed to be awe-inspiring well this one old i mean it's it's a drama piece it doesn't need amazing camera movements but he tried he tried this one tried to michael bay that thing or no what? no no nothing like that <laughs> he tried this one because he was he was trying to evoke the sense of a pendulum swinging swinging back and forth which you know for a movie that is dealing with timey-wimey stuff that made but it was so so poorly done and execute where it was just like the the camera just went off screen to the left and then i i don't know if it was a pan or a truck but you know it just just slid over to the right until everybody fell off screen on the other side and, and then came back and i was like i i get that you were going for a pendulum mm. but it it had nothing to do with this scene <laughs> it was just just can't like stuff like i mean mean, he's made so many movies how do you mess up something like that it was you know i i I tend to give people a lot of grace when it comes to these things it's easy from the outside to look at it and say how could you mess this up so bad when you know you don't know what all the inner workings are yeah things that are going on over there we you you don't know who's like like you're saying with the the other movie her yeah it, it seemed to you like the ending was written by somebody else when in fact it could be mm-hmm. the ending was written uh, that's the original ending and everything else was rewritten by the studio for all we sure. know I, mean, I don't think that's yeah. the case but you know so <laughs> it's it's very it's very hard for us to to look at it from the outside and have any sort that's of true. sense but m night has had a history of making movies that i just i generally feel okay about i mean uh-huh. you know i mean i like the village one and Yep. The, signs. he needs to stop the signs was good the 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 lady in the lake or the pool or whatever it was called that one was other than him being in it i was like you really have to start <laughs> stop putting yourself in your movies dude. oh he did that you, again you, in you, old so and, i and, and gave himself one of the most hilarious unintentionally hilarious lines mm. i couldn't stop laughing until uh, it's really you. hard to it's really hard to watch a director put himself in the movie and not think back to pulp fiction and quentin tarantino and think well at least it wasn't that okay because that was the worst that yes. was the worst white quentin tarantino I mean, dropping the n word over and over again yeah. and you're just like uh what <laughs> no, you, that's... you have you have no uh like context or reference for this but if i were to ask you if you were watching the water to determine whether or not you believe someone has drowned if so you're you're looking out at the water you think right. someone might have drowned how long would you watch before you would say they, they must be drowned there's no other explanation how long would you wait I mean, most people. I mean, I, I, I would wait for the body to pop up usually, right. but um, <laughs> I mean, Just, a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, okay. maybe four minutes. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be longer than that okay. because most people, it, once they start, you know, it, people can hold their breath for really long periods of time if they train sure. themselves and they're ready for it. But when you're not ready for it, yeah, it's like thirty seconds and you start gulping sure, water. Sure, sure. So sure. yeah. So I, uh, the only explanation for one of the lines that comes out of M Night Shyamalan's character's mouth is that he must have Googled 
exactly how long does it take to asphyxiate or something? Because he gives a minute and second number that he watched and not one second longer that is so brief (laughs) that I'm like, wait a second, you wanted to make sure those people had drowned and you couldn't watch for one second longer than what Google told you take is the amount of time it takes to asphyxiate. Like, it was the most bizarre and specific thing that anyone could have said. And I couldn't stop laughing until the end of the movie because of it. So anyway, enough for me. What did you watch? Uh, I did not watch much this, this week. Okay. And uh, we my, my son graduated from high school last week. Uh, my wife's birthday was on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I've been cooking and pre- prepping because we had a couple people over. Kind of a walkthrough cocktail party mm-hmm. with all of the people that we knew. Uh, for the most part, we were fairly s- certain were, you know, safe and whatever. Mm-hmm. So uh, we had, a, you know, I was prepping for that. So the only thing we watched this weekend uh, was High School Musical. Okay. <laughs> and you say to yourself, Tom... What on God's green earth would have gotten you to sit down to watch High School Musical? Because literally during the first two seconds, I was like, oh, I don't want to watch this because ah. it was terrible. Oh, okay. I mean, it is really, really bad. I mean, I'm, and I, 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 the, the titles become very confusing in that series, so I'm not even right. going to try. Like, was it just the first? It's, it's the first one. Okay. It was Zach Efron and oh, okay. Okay. other people. Okay. So uh, I think that's what kind of launched his career, right? Am I wrong about that? Is, is, I, I don't recall school? clearly I, enough. I, it was definitely a thing that got him. Yeah, well, well it was 2006. On, so. okay. It looks like it was made with maybe ten thousand okay. dollars. Like it looks like a movie that was made yeah. directly for the Disney Channel. Sure. Like it's it's and it's fine. That's I fine. mean, it's fine. Yeah. It's it's it's. There's nothing really wrong with it. Um, but the reason we watch it is because my son's name is my youngest son's name is Soren, mm-hmm. and when he goes to the rec center after school, uh, somebody keeps singing the song at him. Soren, fly in something, something, something. Oh, okay. And uh, it's, we found out over the weekend that is from a musical, from this ah. musical, from the High School Musical. So we watched the whole movie to see the stupid song, mm-hmm. and it was I was told it was at the beginning, and I was lied to. It was actually at the end. Ah. Uh, so we watched the whole movie, and yeah, you I mean. I can understand why tweens like it. Mm-hmm. It has like all the little elements that they care about. And, <laughs> you know, the, the, the social groups are very 2006. You know, there's the jocks and the nerds and the and the skaters. It's all very silly. Okay. But um, yes, I watched it. It's a movie. Don't great. Don't don't watch it. <laughs> don't 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 do it. Uh yeah, and then I, I'm I, I caught I caught I watched enough of Mythic Quest to get to the second episode that's not ah uh, backstory that has nobody else in it. You got to backstory, the backstory one, yes. yes, and that was good. That was good. I mean, some good some good uh, acting and directing yeah. in these in these things. So yeah, and I'm still watching um, Agent Carter, uh, and I cool. guess uh, uh, Disney Plus put up a bunch of like shorts that were I think were on YouTube. So like uh, Team oh. Thor, Team Daryl, there was an Agent Carter yeah, short yeah, yeah, that was up yeah. there. Those are all really fun. We watched those last night and it was cute. Yeah, we there were the ones that were like extra features on the disc releases. Right. And then I think there were a couple that were just webisodes. So I think they're kind of yeah. all just thrown up there now as, as Marvel Cinematic Universe shorts. Which is great. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. I mean, I, I stuff like that is, is fun. So, yes, we watch that. Cool. All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. You can go to avrant.com, find our old episodes, older, elder, older, historic mm-hmm. episodes. Uh, Facebook.com slash avrant podcast, YouTube.com slash avrant, where you can see our live recording sessions and our voices probably out of sync and everything else. This year, this week, who knows what you'll see over there? Could be yep. anything because uh, we've had a lot of internet. Problems, yeah, my, so. my internet might go down, so who knows what it'll be. <laughs> but we'll have something. Contact Rob directly, Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter's at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter's at avrent underscore Tom. So we got some listeners of the week. Uh, let's become a listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is go to avrent.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and leave us a PayPal donation. So we want to thank George and Dan. I think it's George. It's not Jorge. I don't think it's just George and Dan. I mean, that is just spelled George, that one. So we will say George Uh, and Dan. Thank you very much for the PayPal donations. We appreciate the financial support. I'm going to look it up again just to make sure that I didn't didn't spell it wrong. Ah. We also want to thank our 143 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service that you can sign up. 
to become a, a contributing listener. Every month, they'll take a little bit of money from you and give most of it to us. So thank you very much to our listeners, mm-hmm. our, our patrons. Patreon.com slash Podcast. That's the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. You choose the amount, and that amount will automatically be debited from you and most of it given to us. So big thank uh, you to our 143 patrons over there. Tom looked it up. What does it say? Is it George? Is it Jorge? It looks like George. Okay. All right. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Just uh, do something to support us, and we'll mention you here. So we want first and uh, most most importantly, in my mind at least, because it affects me. Uh, I want to thank Dan. Dan re- uh, tried to reach out to me on Twitter a while ago, but I didn't. F- I didn't follow him, so the DM never went. Mm. I never got it. So Rob told me about it. So I followed him and I got the DM numbers. Anyways, he had an extra or a not unused Harmony Remote Plus hub that uh, he has graciously sent to me. I mm. received it yesterday. Okay, cool. Uh, it's for my parents. Yeah. So I will be bringing them over to them shortly. They are very excited. I am very excited. I want to thank Dan very, very much. So thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate it. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dan. All right. We got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from Dale. Uh, uh, David, who says thank you for the speaker recommendations we gave for his daughter's bedroom setup. He's going to give the Prime Wireless speakers a try. And he and he likes that they'll provide an option to add a subwoofer in the future if needed. So that's perfect. Always good. I think you'll like things. them. Kevin, who says he's been a listener for 10 years. Aha. Uh, Andrew, who says, we always make a remark that, that the vinyl fans are going to come for our heads whenever we say it isn't the best format. I don't say it's not the best format. I say it's the worst format. So there you <laughs> go. But that never seems to happen. So he sent a joke email to do it for them. The outrage. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get us uh, uh, canceled. That's right. That's just not going to happen, dude. It's not actually the worst format. I think real to real is the worst <laughs> format. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it kind of depends. I think that they're head and head. Uh, Gorinder, who said Tom said how he didn't appreciate the way Gorinder's niece's novel, The Orb Oracle, a book that I do not recommend you buy in any way, shape, or form, is physically larger in its print form than the print version of Bob Moore, No Hero, a book that I do recommend you buy. Mm. It's actually free if you get the digital copy. Mm -hmm. Uh, We said how some forced perspective ought to have been used to make Tom's book look bigger, so he has done so. So if you're on YouTube, you will see it or the Flickr thing. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm you will see that my book is, in fact, larger and therefore better than that other book. That's that's how that, books are judged, for that's sure. That's how they're judged. <laughs> that's how I'm judging it's this a, one. It's a good reminder that a two-dimensional picture of something doesn't necessarily tell you the true size. Worst perspective. I know, I'm weird, huh? Can trick yeah, it. that's right. That's why we say you build a box. Well, thank you to Dale and David, Kevin, Andrew, and Gurinder. We definitely appreciate those notes of gratitude, the notes of encouragement that... Uh, help remind us why we why we do this thing week in and week out so that's that's a wonderful reminder and thank you so much for the support thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions so in the news the gaming giant ea or electronic arts for those of you who i guess just were born is reportedly very keen on either being bought or forming a merger apparently talks with disney to merge ea with espn happened back in march but did not continue forward and the merger of nbc universal and ea was in the works but fell through when they couldn't agree on a price and corporate structure now talks with apple and amazon are rumored to be taking place ea's andrew wilson is reportedly intent on remaining ceo of ea after whatever buyout or merger happens so i don't know I mean, so th- I, I put it in there because this was literally a joke of ours when Activision Blizzard got purchased and Bungie got purchased and yeah. like all, all these huge, huge gaming studios are just getting bought up and we're like, well, who's next? EA? Because they're the biggest. And we, I kind of thought that wasn't going to happen. Like they just, they just have perennial money-making machines. They, they just have to update the rosters on their sports fans. I know. And the sports fans just buy them every year whether the game got any better or not. In fact, oftentimes the game gets worse and they still buy it because they just want the updated roster. More microtransactions, more things walled <laughs> off behind paywalls. Right. Yeah. So yeah. for them to want to get purchased... Now, the names that have not been mentioned in any of the rumors are Microsoft or Sony, which 
Right. I don't know if it's just a matter of they're just too big for that to happen. They, the, the rumors, uh, all these things, the things that are being reported are more about mergers than just full-on acquisitions. So maybe the figure they have in mind for the value of EA is, you know, well beyond the $69 billion that Activision Blizzard got. And even Microsoft can't stomach the price that they're asking for a full-on acquisition or something along those lines. That's pure uh-huh. speculation on my part. But yeah. Regardless, uh, I mean, are we going to be left with any game studios that aren't a part of some other larger conglomerate? It's kind of bizarre, but uh, oh. but if EA can get bought, then then any literally anybody can get bought. So we'll see what happens. We'll watch how it plays out. All right, at the SID, I guess that's what it says, <laughs> SID Display Week Conference in California, something I just now heard of for the very first time. <laughs> Chinese manufacturer BOE showcased a prototype of its true QLED display. <laughs> it, they dubbed it AMQLED. MQ, whatever. For active matrix quantum dot light emitting diodes. So unlike the LCD displays and that Samsung and other mar- uh, others market as QLED, BOE's prototype is a fully self uh, self emissive display. There's no backlight and nothing but quantum dots themselves producing all of the light. Mm-hmm. Electroluminescent quantum dots are laminated into a TFT, TFT backplane that directly stimulates them with electrical current to produce red, green, and blue light. I don't know. That. I don't like that word stimulates and backlight, <laughs> backplane. It just it sounds like somebody's getting goosed. That's all I'm uh, saying. Ah, okay. Wow. can't help it weird can't help it that's just that's just mm. that's where my brain goes and that's why everybody should think just like me <laughs> furthermore an inkjet manufacturing process is used which means true qled displays could potentially debut at a lower price than we might have expected self admitting admitting quantum dots can produce exceedingly precise color points which means full rec 2020 is achievable and there's no opportunity for burn-in so this could definitely be the next big thing in display technology so yeah, everybody hold on to your shorts. Here it comes. Right. Yeah, so I mean, the whole idea of quantum dots is that when a higher frequency energy uh, is sent into the quantum dots, they then convert that very efficiently. It's like, uh, I think it's close to 98% efficiency, uh, convert mm. that into a lower wavelength. So what we've been doing so far with our quantum dot backlights is having a blue LED, a traditional LED blue, that's the short wavelength, uh, then goes into red and green quantum dots, red and green being longer wavelengths than blue light, so they're stimulated by the blue light and then convert that very efficiently into red and green light. But to have a quantum dot just produce blue on its own, you need a wavelength even shorter than the blue light. You could use ultraviolet, <laughs> that, that, that could work, but The idea is that they just want to have an electrical current. We have these TFT backplanes that we've used for, you know, all of our LCDs and everything to light up our backlights all this time. They just want to use that same technology and then have the quantum dots themselves directly emit all three colors of light. So that is like in prototype form now. It's not a theory. It's it's built and shown. It can be done. They've always wanted to be able to make quantum dot or even OLED displays with inkjet printing yeah, inkjet process stuff, because yeah, instead yeah. of picking and placing like we do with micro leds uh or batch little batches of them but still using like literally a robot arm to pick up and place things which obviously is slower and less efficient than a inkjet printer that can just go back and forth and you move the plane through and print the darn thing out so given that all of that is like It happened. It's not a theory anymore. Uh, We're probably still five years away from this, but I'm excited by this because that that Mm. this is the next this is the next thing. And and by all accounts, all the things that OLED is still you know slightly not great at, pure quantum dots uh, should should fix all of that. So excited. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm very excited. Look at me. Yep. This is coming out of his boots. This is my excited face. That's right. And also voice andrew updated his sofa baton x1 uh, remote review for av gadgets still not for sale at amazon like they promised oh i mean <laughs> I, I saw it there after the kickstarter ended so are they really it says coming soon it oh, does not okay say okay well i guess they're, they're out of i stock. can't even okay. i cannot even find it on amazon like when mm. i go search for it it does not come up the biggest takeaway is that it, commands from the hard buttons are now sent immediately when you push them no more pushing a button once just to wake up the remote and then having to push a a button a second time to actually send the command mm-hmm. the screen still needs to wake up by moving the scroll wheel first before a soft button command can be sent though 
So which go. makes sense. I mean, you're going to look at the screen anyway. So speaking of the screen, you can select how long it remains illuminated now, and the learning function is no longer completely broken. Mm -hmm. It isn't perfect, but if you keep it at it, it's at least functional. So if a Baton support team is remaining responsive in the forum, they've added lots of codes by request, and the app keeps uh, the app updates keep coming. You still need to have some patience when you're setting it up and you still need to give uh, some instructions to uh, any new user. It isn't dead simple, foolproof, or plug and play, but Andrew appreciates the efforts that uh, that has been shown and improvements that have been made. He says he's about 90% satisfied with it, using it as his only remote for the past month. That's what he says he's been doing. So yep. yes, um, it's still not there yet. And it may never get there. Uh, honestly, it may it may, it may never... require a version two. There might have to yeah, be some I, hardware changes. I, and and you know, fair enough. I, I it's easy to look at Harmony and go, well, how come it's not as good as Harmony? Well, you know, they made remotes for a really long time yep. before they came out with their hub based one, and they had already had a ton of remotes before that. That's right. To work through a lot of the problems that uh, uh, Sofa Baton and stuff like that is trying to trying to fix with just one remote well, and, and now even that when there's no harmony, harmony had their first hub based one people didn't love the button layout and yeah. then they did another yeah. one that was very similar but they just you know repositioned some of the buttons and people were happier with it so the notion that on their first try yeah. it isn't a, a runaway home run uh I, what's encouraging is that they continue to support it and work at it they didn't just throw it out into the world and then mm -hmm you know, wipe their hands of it. So uh, I am still encouraged by it. I'm still glad it exists. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, right. just realize that you do need to be someone who's a little bit patient with it. It's not necessarily going to be the easiest, you know, cleanest thing to set up. But as long as you go into it, eyes open, I think it's, I can give it a, it's okay to buy. It's a, it's a not avoid. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Some comments here from listeners. Jason wanted to share his recommendation for outdoor speaker wire. He's just using the 12 gauge wire that is sold as low voltage landscape lighting wire. He's found the jacket can be insanely tough and durable, so much so that even a weed whacker doesn't cut through it, and it's very affordable, only about $100 for 250 feet of 12 gauge. So you can get that at Home Depot, apparently. You can get it at Home yeah. Depot. So just a uh, bit of knowledge to keep in your back pocket. And I mean, yes, he, he said in his email, he's like, wire's wire, right? Like, it's just, as, long as, as long as you got a continuous electrical connection, it's not going to be an issue. And if it's 12 gauge, so uh, this stuff is a little bit stiffer, as you might expect. It is not highly stranded and super pliable, but for something that is going to be permanently all, uh, installed outside, that makes sense. So there you go. Yeah. Good option. Yeah. Uh, I would put that uh, toughness up to the test uh, in, because my children, when they do yard work, uh, they have zero ability to figure out that what they're doing could in fact be wrong mm. and instead will just soldier on mm -hmm. straight through. So we would see. We would see how tough that wire was. Ara says he enjoys uh, the little tidbits of we sometimes share from our own and uh, and our listeners' personal lives and talents outside of home theater. So he figured we'd share a couple of things about he'd share a couple of things about himself. First, he enjoys using traditional methods for the things he creates. He records music and music videos, and they do it live to tape. He's shared a quick preview of a song he's still working on. I mean, he's been working on the song for a while because this YouTube video, which I did click on. Uh, is from 2016. Oh, okay. So he, he's been working on it for a hot minute. Uh, so you'll be able to see that. Uh, second, he draws and paints, all completely done by hand. Pen and ink on paper, brushes and oil uh, paint on canvas. He shared his Tumblr and says that Tom likes his work and wants any artwork done for future projects to get in touch. So that I did look at it. It is very nice. He's got the These, oil stuff in particular. I was really, really impressed by this. This yeah. is this is really good artwork. And I mean, a whole bunch of them on his Tumblr, he has labeled as like still in progress. And I'm like, oh. That's, yeah, well, that's still in progress. It does seem like he's the kind of guy that <laughs> that never uh, that's never really truly sure. done with anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, His uh, projects artists, are abandoned, way. not completed. One of those artists, which is very understandable. I completely right. get where he's coming from, but yeah, really, really impressive artwork there. So uh, yeah, wonderful. We will have the links. And speaking of artists, mm -hmm. let's get to our questions. Aris says when he visited Simply Stereo, uh, where is that? In, is that a Canadian store? Is that an nope. American store? Where is that? So I, I that he is. mentioned it and I forgot, so I, I, I don't, don't remember. 
Anyway, so you visited Simply Stereo. It's probably a art store. R.S. got to see their projection uh, demo. The last time he'd seen a home the uh, home projection setup years ago, he wasn't super impressed. But this setup, which wasn't even really high end, uh, it was a 1080p projector on a 120 inch screen, really surprised him in a good way. So he's got a 77 inch OLED, and while the picture quality is fantastic, even his current setup, which is smaller, uh, even his current setup, which is smaller than the future living room is smaller than he'd like that's a lot smaller back -back. <laughs> anyways uh that all, ha all has him considering a projection setup with his anticipated room length of about 20 feet and his anticipated seating distance of about 12 feet he figured the screen size of about 140 inches is what he really wants and he means 135 he'd <laughs> that would be the uh, more go standard screen size yeah yeah really you're not gonna pay like a f extra thousand dollars or five hundred dollars sure. for Although... a if for he 140 inch somehow screen. ends up going with Seymour AV, they just go by even foot right. widths. So the uh, 10 foot wide would be 137 inches diagonal. Yeah. So that, that might be the size he ends up with. But yes, yeah. somewhere in that range, which is a perfectly reasonable size for sitting 12 feet away. That that right. makes all the sense. Yeah. So he'd go for a JVC projector if he does this. So first of all, would that screen size and throw distance even work? Uh, well, like Rob said, it, you know, like I was joking about and Rob was saying uh, about uh, Seymour AV, there are standard screen size out there mm -hmm. and 140 ain't one of them. So right. uh, yeah. you're, you're much better off picking one that is a standard size sure. because it's just like we always talk about economies of scale. That's what that's, you know, they, if they have to one off one for you, mm -hmm. It costs a lot more. So the 135 inches, if you go with a fixed frame or, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, something from uh, um, Silver Ticket, Silver Ticket, mm -hmm. or one of those, which is what I have, and would be perfectly fine, even if it was, or Elite Screens, if it was acoustically transparent, mm -hmm. you know, you you these would be all perfectly fine for that seating distance. Oh yeah, um, and then Seymour of AV would be. You know, the step up mm -hmm. in quality and you could get a, a slightly larger size for you know quite a bit more money yeah so. and in terms of uh throw distance i mean that's a good opportunity if you aren't into projectors um and you're and you're just interested in it projectorcentral.com is a wonderful resource they cover virtually every projector model that is out there and then they have they call it their projection throw calculator that is for every model. Look up any model of projector. Uh, you'll see the specs, and they will have the projection throw calculator uh, in there. And you can click on that and use that. So I just always like to remind people, the JVC projectors, we're talking about the new uh, NZ7 and NZ8, the laser 4K models yeah. that have the 8K E-Shift capability. They have the DCI 4K resolution, the 4096 across by 2160 rather than what we're used to, which is 3840 by 2160. 16 by 9 is 3840 by 2160. The JVCs are slightly wider. The native panel is slightly wider, 4096 instead of 3840. So there is a little drop down thing in Projector Central's projection throw calculator for the JVC models that lets you choose either the full width resolution or 16 by 9. Uh, aspect ratio and it's important to select that because otherwise when you're putting in the diagonal for your screen you're gonna think that you can get a different size than you really can in 16 by 9 right. if you've left it at the native uh you know uh aspect ratio of that 4096 with panels so um once you plug it in and i i went with his 140 inch size just to make sure because i think it will be 135 or 137 it's easy to go smaller. It's not necessarily easy to go larger if you don't have just the physical distance from the screen. Uh, but there shouldn't really be any problem. The NZ7, the NZ8, or the NP5, if you go with the less expensive lamp-based model, uh, the minimum distance from the screen to the lens of the projector for 140 inches diagonal 16 by 9 is just a little over 15 feet. So if your room is 20 feet long, that should not be a problem. We do need to keep in mind there is the body of the projector behind the lens, and these projectors are big. They're about 20 inches deep. So count on, you know, almost two feet of depth for the body of the projector. And then right. JVC wants you to have a foot and a half of air, 18 inches of open air behind the projector for ventilation purposes. So all in all, where's like, take where the lens is and add about three and a half feet. That's, that's kind of what you want. But even then, we're still under 19 feet. 
you know, 18 and a half yeah. feet at that point. So regardless, this will fit in this room. It'll be able to throw that screen size. But if you're going over 150 inches or something, it starts to get a little bit squishy. So you might want to double check with that uh, projection throw calculator over at projectorcentral.com. So he's well aware he would no longer have OLED black levels and that the level of ambient uh, room lighting is super important. He knows that uh, he knows he'd be trading out now image quality for sheer size. But with his proposed setup, would he still be able to get a pretty bright image with good contrast? Uh, as long as you're like 135, mm -hmm. may, maybe up to 140, but 135, mm -hmm. I think that you will. Yep. Uh, once you get over that is when you start just literally not being able to get really get HDR. You just can't get really bright enough. That's uh, right. For the HDR. To be clear, but, you'd be fine for standard dynamic range. You got yeah, yeah. you got plenty of light output for standard dynamic range, but if you want HDR highlights to visibly appear brighter than SDR yeah. highlights, 135 is about the upper limit for for the light output of like the NZ7 or the NZ8. Um so on that point, you're fine. The contrast is pretty much all down to your room. That That's what's going to let you determine the contrast because right. how bright the projector get, that stays constant. That's, that's how bright the projector is able to get. Where you end up with your contrast varying is how deep is the black level. Now, if your room is completely pitch black and that means the walls are flat black and the ceiling and the floor are flat black and there's no reflection of light going on in that room, well then... The black is as black as the projector is able to get, but that is pretty rare. And he's talking about having this in a living room set up, which means you are not going to have that completely blacked out room. There is no chance your living room is going to be that. Uh, I wouldn't believe it for one second that your living room is going to be that. He has talked that he plans to enclose his living room, which is a little bit unusual, but not out of the question. But I don't believe for a second it's going to be completely pitch black and all painted black on all six surfaces. So at that point, it's like, okay, how much light reflects around the room, ends up back on the screen, slightly washes out those black levels, and that determines right. your contrast. So you definitely want to black out whatever windows are in this living room as much as you possibly can because sunlight coming in around blinds or around curtains or whatever will definitely raise your black levels. You want to black that out when the projector is in use as much as you possibly can. And the rest of the room, you want to ideally, if, if image quality is 100% your goal, ideally make it as dark and non-reflective in the rest of the room as you're able to reasonably in, in what is still a living room. Uh, but yeah, that... That's what's going to determine it. The black level is definitely not going to be an OLED, but that doesn't mean it can't still look good and be satisfying because you will have the sheer size to compensate. So uh, my room is com is uh, is enclosed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a projection set up. My room is enclosed. There is a there's two windows. There's one that is behind the screen, which the screen blocks for the most part. There's a mm -hmm. little bit of the window left at the top, but you, that doesn't affect the screen at all. Uh, and then there's a window to the right of directly to the right of my couch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during night or whatever, you know, we have blackout curtains in here. They just mm -hmm. hang, you know, kind of like, uh, they have the, the, the round grommets at the top where the thing goes through and it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the night, it's fine. Mm -hmm. If the, somebody leaves the door, uh, cracked open, uh, and there's lights on in the kitchen, it'll come in through the door mm -hmm. and cast a, you know, there'll be like a visible line mm -hmm. and everybody gets mad and somebody says, <laughs> close the door. Exit door is open. But do, uh, during the day, light leaks around that window mm -hmm. to the right. And the way we try to combat that, and the way I've thought about doing it, is basically Velcroing, put a line sure. of Velcro up the wall. But uh, I'm planning on painting in here someday. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't done that yet. So what we do is we take like a like a little two-pound hand weight that my mom used to use, and she doesn't use them anymore. So mm -hmm. uh, she... She gave them to us, and we put that sort of in, in the windowsill to like pull the the curtain taut. Okay. And even then, you still get a little mm -hmm. bit of light. Mm -hmm. So, what Rob's saying about you know not being able to black this thing completely out, especially during the day, mm -hmm. it is really hard to black out everything, even right. with blackout curtains. Now so, that doesn't mean. You're watching a football game and it's unviewable right. or anything like no, that at all. No. But if you're watching, you know, a really 
dark show <laughs> that has right. you know nothing but tiny little shadows going on it might be pretty hard to make out during the day exactly yeah. what you're seeing on there so you want to vary your content a little bit like that in a setting like that tom's next display might be a flat panel the, those those qnet qn 90 they got down to 2600 dollars. they're really trying to get rid of them the 85 inch so okay you know, yeah well i'll tell my wife <laughs> that's right Okay, I told her. She said no. Okay. Uh, he'd be given up Dolby Vision. He knows this, but he's, he'd still get HDR10 from Dolby Vision sources, right? That is true. That's correct. From what we've said about JVC's frame by frame tone mapping, it wouldn't be any big loss, right? Uh, yeah. Honestly, no. I don't think no. It would be a huge loss. In fact, I've, I've made the <laughs> argument and I stand by it. I kind of wish that HDR content just threw out. You know, it's it's numbers, no metadata attached to it, no Dolby Vision or even HDR10 metadata, just basic PQ10 signal, and that every display had frame by frame dynamic tone right. mapping. I I actually feel and believe genuinely that that is the best way for us to handle HDR. So I love what the JVC projectors do, and I'm not worried for one second that it doesn't have Dolby Vision. Yeah, I um, I sort of see where Rob's coming from here, but I do think that if that were what we had mm -hmm. uh we would have very good implementations of frame by frame and very poor ones and it would yeah but then you get end to choose <laughs> yeah but you know so it's one or the other yeah uh he does not intend to use an acoustically transparent screen he likes to see his speakers and their drivers so his kef reference towers and large center would be on either side and below the projection screen given that they have a high gloss finish would that be bad for the image quality so a little bit i'm good i have had these aren't these current speakers are not glossy mm -hmm. i have had glossy speakers mm -hmm. uh, tower speakers the appearing varus grand speakers are glossy mm -hmm. speakers and yes you can see the reflection of the screen on the the speaker itself right. do i notice in any way the speakers reflecting light back onto mm -hmm. the screen and somehow washing it out i have never noticed that okay never in all of my years of doing this <laughs> i've never noticed that <laughs> uh never once thought oh i can see the the, the, the speaker reflected back onto the screen mm -hmm. i i just it, it, it's just never happened even with the non-glossy speakers you can they still reflect light it's sure. just that you can't see the i mean with the glossy speakers it's like looking in the mirror you can see right. the, the upside image down in the side of the speaker yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's still light coming off of the non-glossy mm. speakers too so it's not like there's a matte finish out there that doesn't reflect you know uh right. that i'm aware of well. so would it be bad for the image quality no it would it be, might might it be distracting mm. it might be to you it just it, i would notice it and then immediately forget about it and go back to watching my movie mm. so for me it didn't it didn't make any difference in my viewing right habits or, i mean in his, or enjoyment. in his current setup he's it he's got what looks like a, a little covering or cloth on the top of his center speaker because i i believe that yeah. was likely because he was seeing a reflection of his oled in the top yeah. of the speaker and found that a little bit distracting that I'm guessing at that but it, uh, that all adds up and makes sense and would be uh, would be reasonable so I mean a similar thing with your projection setup I mean I was when I say a little bit uh, that's coming from the the purely technical theoretical right. would the would the ideal be glossy surfaces in a room with a projection setup no it would not but just like it isn't realistic to expect your living room to be flat black paint it isn't realistic to expect you know your speakers are going to be completely flat black holes that absorb all light that comes to them. So I agree with Tom. You'll be fine. That's not like in the living room setup. I wouldn't expect the glossy speakers to be the weakest link by any stretch. The rest of your room will be a much weaker link than that when it comes to whatever happens to the image on screen. So a JVC projector would be a big purchase for him, and that means he would intend to keep it for many years before his next upgrade. So it makes sense to go with the NZ8 over the NZ7 in this case. Is there enough of a difference to just to, to make the extra $5,000 worth it? Yes. He was thinking maybe he if he ends up keeping his projector for 10 years, 8K will actually become a thing, and it will have better... It will be better to have the full 8K E-Shift X offered by the NZ8. What do we think? I think there's no force on earth that could get me to buy that NZ8 for $5,000. Ah. Now, see, when we've been talking to Carl about his Vanta Black Theater, that yeah. is the scenario where I go, you know what? 
the NZ8. It's a little bit deeper black levels. That, right. That is the room where you would right. actually be able to see it. And since Carl can afford this stuff, I'm okay with saying, you know what? You're the customer in Carl's case where yeah. there's some advantage. Again, we are making assumptions about your living room not being we a are. completely black hole, but I, I feel pretty comfortable with that assumption. And I mean, that is the... That is 99.99% of the time. It is true right, that right. there's some ambient light someplace in, in your home theater. Even my home theater, That's which right. is blacked out and well, sealed and built specifically to be a home theater, still has light in there exactly. every once in a while. In Tom's home theater, I would not I would not recommend to Tom spending the extra $5,000 for the NZ8 over the NZ7. I say don't sleep on that NZ7. I think most people... Most people should probably go with the MP5 to be honest and have the that. lamps, but but you know I agree with that. <laughs> I th I think the NZ8. Well, now here actually I wasn't even thinking about this before we started answering. But if your plan is to keep this projector for ten years and ten use years. it as your primary living room display, I might actually encourage you to get the NP5 instead of the NZ7 because you can replace the lamps. You can replace the lamps and <laughs> and the lasers because I don't think that I don't think those lasers will last in ten years, yeah. especially if it's in your living room. It's your primary. Your primary You might be uh, using TV. it quite a lot. I don't know, man. I And you I, can get those a lot. Those lasers make me concerned. Like, it's $4,000 difference between the NP5 and the NZ7. That's a bunch of that's lamps. That's a lot dude. of lamps. <laughs> it's that's like a, 20 that's lamps. New, well, that's a new lamp every year for 10 years before yeah. you've equaled the price. So I'm like, yeah, I think I think you will probably get more than one year out of each lamp. Oh, yeah. Which means financially you come out ahead over 10 years so uh i'm actually yeah, yeah i'm gonna change my tune and say i think you should get the np5 uh yeah. if this is what you proceed with there you go i am not For worried 10 years, uh, at all yeah. about 8k not oh yeah not 8K. even the slightest bit <laughs> yeah that is i think you're thinking you're, i think you're worrying about the wrong spec Sure. Really. Well, I mean, in, he's, in that. he was just looking for, is there any excuse, any reason to go for the NZ8? And I'm like, in, in your sense, <laughs> Now he's no, going to be sad no. that he asked the question because now we're going to talk him down to the MP5. And he well, really I, wanted that, at least that 7 because he wanted lasers. That's right. So, uh, but I mean, we're, we're not saying that just because we are fans of saying money. I'm like, no, there is... There's a darn good reason to actively choose the lamp in this case, because if this is the plan, yeah. and I mean, hey, now you're saving $9,000. You're telling me there isn't stuff you could do in that living room that you could use that $9,000 on? Yeah, yeah, so. Put some walls up for $9,000. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Automate your curtains. You can get some, um, yeah, you can get some real good blackout curtains with a $9,000 yeah, yeah. budget, yeah. Uh. Right, and and I I think that it worrying about 8K in particular, just in general, like I I that honestly don't think he really was. Spec, <laughs> no, I know, I know, but you know, trying to future proof yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. for ten years for any display, mm. the last thing you can, you can worry about is resolution because mm. that's not you that's not the thing that's uh, that you can really predict the best. I mean, I, I see no scenario within the next 10 years where your 4K 120 capable projector is somehow not going to show you an image from something that we're watching. Like, even if right. the original signal does become 8K or even 16K, there's going to be a 4K compatible version. Like, there's, right. there's, I just see no scenario where you're, like, up the creek because you've got a 4K projector instead of an 8K projector. Yeah. So he says that there are new Sony laser projectors, and one of those might cost less than the JVC, but he's a gamer and a PC gamer at that. So he is drawn to the JVCs being able to do 4K 120. Do we agree that a JVC projector is the better gaming choice? For this? Yes. Yeah. Just done. Sure. Simple. <laughs> the Sonys yeah. don't do 4K 120. PC gamer, you want those frame rates. So yeah, absolutely. Get the JVC yeah. in this case. Which is a, if he's going to be a PC gamer, he needs lamps. <laughs> Yeah, you be able to replace these lamps yeah. because no one sits down and plays thirty minutes of right? a PC game. Yeah. You know, you sit down and you start playing, and like six hours later, you stand back up. And you, know, I, you do that three or four times a week, and you're gonna kill that laser. Yeah. I mean, twenty thousand hours is gonna go by yeah, real fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not gonna last ten years, guarantee it. Um, on a different topic, he wears one Bluetooth earphone while he's at work. He's always leaves one ear free. He isn't happy listening to any music, just podcasts and news. He has uh, some JLab 
Bluetooth earphones, but they died after only a year and they were never as comfortable as he would like. Mm. Do we have a suggestion for fully wireless, really comfortable in-ear option for around 50 to 100 bucks? Uh, well, I know I know that Rob's going to recommend Shure because he always well, does. Well, I but, mean, um, the thing was, I, I, I only put the Shure link because I will say these are very, very comfortable. I can wear these absolutely all day long with complete comfort. And their fully wireless version has a nice long battery la life and excellent sound quality. So I'm I'm fine on all those fronts. Those are Shure's Aonic 215, but they're $230. They're way over the budget that he specified. Now, Maybe because we just saved you $9,000, you'll be willing to go over your budget on your earphones and, and go for these. But I, I'm just saying from a comfort and battery life and sound quality standpoint, I'm really happy to recommend the Aonic 215, but definitely over the budget you specified. Um, to get to the budget that you specified, I'll mention Samsung's Galaxy Buds 2. Um, by, by all accounts, I have not worn these all day i can't vouch for them personally but by all accounts everybody says yeah really comfortable work really nicely trouble free and they're 110 dollars, so they're they're very much within the budget that you mentioned i was hoping though uh tom with all your experience uh with earphones that i i think you mentioned you had one that was like the most comfortable you've ever tried so yeah, yeah. the tcls the okay. tcl move uh, move audio s 600s are 99 bucks okay uh and those are the thing is is that they they're dual they're kind of have dual ways of staying in like you mm -hmm. could press the you could press you could press them in to, to like you know friction fit like mm -hmm. most ear but ear, ear in the ear monitors do but they are bulbous so they kind of sit in your ear okay. anyways so it, it's more like they sit in your ear and that silicone tip just basically uh rests against the ear canal so that it doesn't it doesn't allow you know uh, sound to get in from the outside, but it's not necessary for it to be so tight that it uh, that it's keeping the earphone in your ear. Okay. So that means that for me they are extremely comfortable. Mm. I am very I, I'm and I bought them for my son for uh, Christmas last year, and he never takes them off okay they're on constantly so he really really likes them um and i'm certain for uh, podcasts well. and news that the sound quality is more than i really enough, like so. the sound quality on those things okay. too for 99 bucks they yeah. are definitely my go-to okay. so i i have no problems recommending i think i'll defer heavily. to that then that sounds like the real winners tcl move audio s 600s and you can get them from amazon and try them out and if sure. you don't like them you send them back so you know low that's, risk that's what i would do Dale. Dale has had his theater set up in his living room for several years. It's open on the left to his kitchen, and his dining room area is directly behind this couch. So it, isn't, it certainly isn't a dedicated theater room, but he's thinking of moving all his gear to a spare bedroom, so he's got some questions. The answer is yes, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> his existing setup is a three-seater reclining couch, a 65-inch Sony OLED, an Integra 7.2.4 channel pre-pro, Integra 9 channel amp, BMW CM5 bookshelf front left and right speakers, a CM2 center, Boston acoustic soundware 4.5 surround speakers, Golden Ear Force Field 5 subwoofer. He also has some BMW CCM in ceiling speakers on hand. They're still in the box. He bought them to expand the system to Atmos, but then got the idea to move the setup to a dedicated room. So we're seeing, there are some pictures here on Facebook or I mean, or whatever the YouTube channel uh, of the setup. And yes, it's, there's a window on the right. Uh, I mean, all kind of that is kind of, kind of unimportant. That's just what he, what he had. It's a kind of, we've seen his room before. So just a reminder yeah, there. I don't remember it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, he has two potential bedrooms to choose from. Both are quite small, but they have different, uh, slightly different layouts. Bedroom one is nearly square, 10 by 11. The door is in a corner on one of the 11 foot walls. Uh, as you enter the door, there's a 10-foot wall immediately to your left with an open closet space in the middle of it. Uh, there's only one small window on the opposite 11-foot wall. It's diagonally across from the door to uh, the room, across the room from the door. So it sounds like whatever. You guys can figure that out. Yeah. Bedroom two is similar and even closer to being square, 10 by 10 foot, 4 inches. So they're both <laughs> basically square. Pretty close. Uh, again... Again, the door is in the corner of one of the 10 foot four walls, and there's a wall with a closet opening immediately to your left as you enter, which is the same as the other one. The closet opening is all the way to one side of that 10 foot wall though. And then there's a long window on the opposite 10 foot four wall and another window on the other 
on the other 10 foot wall. Yeah, so two so windows in this a... one, one of which is quite wide, and then the closet is yeah. in a different space, and it's even closer to just just being a square. Those are his right. two choices. So, I mean, two Those obviously choices. very similar little bedrooms, and he can use one of them as a completely dedicated enclosed theater, if you'd like to. Right. And, yes. Uh, the closets look like they're built-ins. Uh, Definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're not. Uh, they're not like a closet door that has an opening. It's like a built-in cabinet yeah. with uh, that are all. It's all the way with to the ceiling. Hangers and shelves. So I mean, it is meant to hang up your clothes, but it's not quite your traditional like bifold closet door or something. It's it's more like an opening yeah. with hangers and shelves. Which of these two rooms are better? Is what he asks. Mm -hmm. So, um, which one do we think is better? Uh, I. Where's the other layout? I mean, I like the one? first one. I, 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 I like in I like, comparison. I like the first one too. I don't see any yeah. downside to the first one in comparison to the second one. The second one is slightly smaller, even closer yeah. to being a square, and has more <laughs> windows to deal with. So, if you're okay, if the smaller room had the the win the tent the window on the ten foot wall and the smack dab in the middle of that wall, mm. I would say that. I would still not like that room as much because the <laughs> yeah. other because the other window is bigger and harder right. to deal with. Yeah. But the fact that this is all the way off to the side means that you can't just cover it with a screen, mm. which is what I did in my room, mm -hmm. uh, which ha does have two windows. It has one on the right wall and one in, with the window that's behind the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's smack dab in the middle of the of the space. Um, yes, I like I like this the bigger room with the window on which would will be on the front left wall so i mean talking it... about orientation where we are figuring the screen is going to go on the completely blank 10 foot wall the one right. that wall that has nothing so you've got you've got the door will be in now your rear right corner that'll be right. uh where the door is the closet will be directly behind you in the middle of your back wall and you'll have a single window on the left wall towards the front that's that's the layout yes. we're envisioning in here i think it makes sense right. it makes all the sense <laughs> Makes all the sense. Yeah. I I agree with that. Uh, I kind of wish that you had like a more walk-in closety sort of thing because we could eh. take the doors off and then throw all your equipment in there would be mm -hmm. would be the the go-to. But um, you, but he's got an OLED anyways, so That's he's right. going to end up wanting to set that thing up at the front. And of the I room do think he is. had it in mind that he wanted to wall mount it again because that's what he did in his living room, which you can certainly do in this first room that we're proposing. You got a completely blank wall where you could wall mount right. it, but. If for some reason, like some, something else about the construction of the house that we're not privy to in this email, uh, you know, there right, right, could right, be right. something about where the rooms are in the house that makes the second one the better choice for some reason. I mean, you can always put a flat panel on a stand. There is no reason it has to be mounted to the wall. And if you just don't like the, you know, actually physically having a stand look, you can get one of the three-in-one style stands that has, you know, essentially a pole that sticks up the back and you mount the TV on that instead of just actually having it standing on something. So there are definitely options either way, but I don't I don't see any reason to avoid bedroom number one that is, you know, a slightly ever so slightly larger and has the, the closet in the middle of what will be our back wall. Yeah, that's the one I'd go for. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so his next question is just basically where to put everything. So how yeah. should the Orient set up? What, which wall gets a TV? Where does the couch go? Where do a surround and Atmos speakers go? Where, do, where does the subwoofer go? Well, first of all, his subwoofer needs a friend. And one other thing is, uh, I mean, we do have limited space in here. I can't picture putting the subwoofers in the midpoints of the two side walls because you're just not going to no, have any walkway work. if you do that. You could theoretically do middle of the front wall, middle of the back wall. That would mean it, you know, one is essentially in the closet space and one is directly below your center speaker. So that might be a little bit challenging. So I'm thinking diagonally opposite corners makes a lot of sense. And you have diagonally opposite corners in this room because the closet is centered rather than pushed all the way over to the side. So you could do, you know, right. rear left corner, front right corner for subwoofer placement. So the, the, the TV and the entertainment system goes on the, the blank 10 foot wall, like we already said. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then rear left corner, or it might be slightly into the room, depending on what's going on in your front right Could corner. Could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends on how wide that that entertainment center is mm -hmm. and uh, how much space you have. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's not room for surround back speakers and Atmos and everything else in here. So uh, your couch is going to go 
I mean, it depends on how wide that couch is because a lot of couches are about 10 feet wide. Well, I mean, his is a, should have enough space. Yeah, should have that, enough space. that three seater that he had, it looks like it's the, the sort of standard because the middle seat is a bit narrower than the two outside yeah, seats. I didn't really look at it. Uh, so, you know, and it, only the outside seats recline. So that's a pretty standard design that's typically 76, 78 inches in width. That's, that's almost always what all, all of those couches are that are that style. So... If you center that in the room widthwise, it it is leaving you like slightly less than a two foot walkway on either side. Um, <laughs> so you're you're you're, you're kind of yeah, squeezing you yourself to. by there. But I don't I don't really th feel that that's a big problem in here because I mean the only thing you're coming into this room to do is watch your home theater. So if you've got yeah. to turn a little sideways and walk past the couch, I don't really consider that a huge downside in this one. And to me, like if you're sticking with that 65 inch screen size, or even if you went up to the 77 inch and bought a new TV or something, like I'm still picturing the couch is about seven feet away from the TV, the TV mounted on the front wall. That leaves you a pretty comfortable like three and a half feet behind you. But basically the, the door can fully swing in. It's not going to crash into the side of the couch. So the couch is in front of the door. Uh, you've got a little bit of space behind you there, and that means you can now mount your surround speakers on your side walls, you know, one of them right. just in front of the door. And because of the window placement, you've got space uh, on the left wall to put the surround speaker behind the window. And I think that all works out swimmingly. Then, um, you know, this being a completely dedicated room, and since you've got the nine channel amp on hand, you could have two pairs of in-ceiling speakers, you know, one that's three and a half feet or four feet in front of you, one that's pretty much on the back wall about three feet behind you top fronts yeah, top yeah. rears is your placement and that's and why you can't have done. surround backs right there is because yeah, yeah. Your oh i would be basically backs, on top yeah. of them yeah, yeah. 5.2.4 uh, is the speaker configuration i'd go for here all day yeah that yeah i agree uh again subwoofer placement we've already talked yeah. about so that shouldn't be an issue i, I mean this it's gonna be tight Oh yes, it, I mean, this it's is gonna the be size tight. Of my room the, the, my, my little den it's about the same so uh and I have a walkway with a speaker that's on a shelf that is, you know, basically every time you walk by that shelf, you have a chance of hitting yourself because mm -hmm. it's 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 a tight walkway. It's a 10, you know, I have a very wide couch and it, there's about two and a half feet mm -hmm. right there. And so a lot of times I'll nudge my my room treatments as I walk by, but I've never hit, hit the shelf. Mm -hmm. I've never done it and nobody else has either that I am aware of in here. <laughs> so... It's just, you just kind of know it's there. And it, because of the height, it is above your shoulders and that's where you would hit it. Yeah. So, you know, and if your your shoulder is rubbing that wall, you might tap it with your head, but you probably wouldn't. So, you know, it, just be careful as to where you, how you place those those speakers. You should be okay with mm -hmm. them. Uh, what does he need in way of acoustic treatments and where does he place them? Well, I mean, we've talked about that about a bajillion times and I've written many articles on it. But the first reflection points uh, on your side walls, mm -hmm. which we have talked now, about how to do that. One of his likely is that window. Is the window. So we'll and be looking at cover. like a freestanding panel there which freestanding panels are available from both Gick and Acoustamac so I would I would probably opt for freestanding panels and I'd have like a couple of them to fully cover uh, first and second reflection second reflection being like uh, you know where that window is we'd be talking about the front right speaker across the room from it its reflection off of the left wall to your ear. That's your second reflection. So, you know, if you have a nice four-foot span in front of that window that's covered, similar on the other side, that's your first reflection points. You might, um, like, depending on what goes in that open closet space, because, I mean, if it's just filled full of clothes i'd probably be fine just leaving that alone it's it's not like it's going to be an echo chamber if it is but if you empty it all out if you don't have anything in there i mean you could just kind of fill that closet opening with insulation uh and and that would provide you the majority of the base trapping that you need in this room to be honest if you if you kind of filled that whole closet opening with insulation and maybe just put a fabric cover covering over it or something to make it look nice um yeah yeah yeah. yeah, you could do a freestanding window, uh, freestanding panel uh, for that front left speaker, like Rob mm -hmm. said. You could also maybe, depending on, uh, it's very, it, you have what looks like uh, like Venetian blinds that are right. inside the window frame, but it's hard to tell if 
if it's all mounted inside and there's like a little it looks like there's some sort of cover at the top mm. and i'm trying to figure out if that's part of the windowsill or part of the or is it just if it's decorative mm -hmm. or if it's yeah like you might be able to hang the panels right over the window right over the window yeah, just that's right them. and then yeah. just and then put you know uh, uh you could block a lot of the light that mm -hmm. way and then maybe put a uh a blackout curtain behind it if you sure. wanted to uh, or around it so you, you're gonna have you have to like figure that out for yourself yeah. uh but, but I mean, we're in treating here the in a small room back we're Go treating ahead. the sides um if, if i'm kind of in love with that idea of kind of filling up that whole closet because that means you're not going to need a ton of additional i mean you could you could look at doing you know maybe the the front corners uh, that's certainly yeah. not going to hurt anything, uh, but if you if you can kind of fill up that whole closet opening with absorptive material and, and just make it look nice, uh, maybe the front two corners, those side panels is taking care of the back, the first reflections, the base trapping, the corners. I don't think you need a whole lot more than that. You know, we we don't want to go so nuts in here that it really sounds dead. So yeah. I mean, this is not a huge amount of surface area. It's a small there room. There is not. To get to fifteen small room, to get to fifteen percent right. of that, you don't need a ton. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's about it, to be honest. And then listen. Just get in there and listen. How does it mm -hmm. sound? You know, how does how the bass sweep sounds after you run your Odyssey or uh, I don't I know if in, what Integra uses these right. days. So uh, after you run your room treatment, uh, room correction, how does it sound? And then. If it sounds, if it still sounds like the base is uneven, well, go buy some tri traps and throw right. them in the corner someplace. If you look at the uh, Gick room kits or the Acoustamac room kits, it'll be the ones that are like four corner base traps and six to eight panels. Like that's that's around the amount that I'm thinking that you need in here. And if you're doing doing it yourself by filling up that uh, closet with insulation, then it's going to be like yeah, yeah, four to six. The thing panels you have to worry about with that closet is the traps. doors. <laughs> yeah the doors vibrating on there so you might want to take the doors off and then just put a curtain over the yeah. top of it yeah because you know, the yeah, base yeah the base, you can just hang a curtain across the closet just, opening don't even have to do just, anything fancy you don't have to really do anything fancy there just put a curtain that goes floor to ceiling and it just it looks like nothing and then you could just throw insulation in there like yeah. literally just shove it in there <laughs> RAF. RAF has a setup using all MK Sound S150 THX Ultra speakers along with four SVS SB3000 subs. We convinced him to keep his X8500H uh, receiver rather than replacing it with an Onkyo RZ50 pretty much only for drag. Mm. That's, I, I'm glad that we said that. I'm mm -hmm. glad that you listened. <laughs> Instead, he's dipping his toe into changing some speaker settings manually, and he started with the crossover and LPF for LFE settings. The low-pass filter for low-frequency effects. Yeah, I'm not really sure why he did that, but okay, here we go. First up, it's suggested right in the manual for his speakers that he used an 80 hertz crossover setting, so that's what he had, but the LPF or LFE setting always defaulted to 120. So we experimented with two different uh, combinations, an 80 hertz crossover for all speakers with the LPF or LFE also set to 80 hertz, and a 120 hertz crossover for all the speakers with the LPF or LFE left at its default 120. Before we get to what he heard in his actual question, we should address that LPF LPF for LFE setting, as well as the THX recommendation to use an 80 hertz crossover for the speakers. Well, he has THX speakers. Yes. This is an important thing, okay? Because uh, THX recommends and assumes that your speakers can play cleanly down to 80 hertz, and then whatever happens after that is between you and the gods you serve well, because they sh you should cross them over. They actually design a little bit more than that. They specify a second order roll off below 80 hertz for a THX certified speaker. You're supposed to get down to just above 80 hertz. At 80 hertz, they want that speaker to be minus three dB and then with a second order roll off. So it's pretty darn specific what a THX specified uh, and certified speaker is supposed to do on the low end. So, I mean, that's, that is what it is. That's the THX certified certification where he's right. running into a bit of confusion and it's understandable is that LPF, LPF. for LFE setting yeah. because that does not need to match the crossover yeah. setting and understandably a lot of people are thinking okay my speakers are playing down to 80 hertz and then rolling off doesn't that mean that everything that comes out of my subwoofer should go as high as 80 hertz and then start to roll off on the on the higher frequencies than that you create this crossover subwoofer plays everything below 80 speakers play everything above 80 and they cross over at 80 the low frequency effects are a channel 
They're their own channel, and the low frequency effects does not necessarily have to be played by a subwoofer. It is right. it's a distinct channel, and this is one thing I've said. I don't know why that LPF for LFE setting exists. It should never be changed from 120. It is not part of base management. It has nothing to do with the frequencies that are mixed into any of the speaker channels and then are, through right. base management, rolled off in the speaker channels and diverted to the subwoofer output. That's base management. That is the, the signal that went to your front left or your front right or your center speaker. That's a full range signal going all the way down to 20 hertz or potentially even lower. That's what's in the signal. And we use base management to divert the base below 80 hertz from those channels to your subwoofer output. But the low frequency effects channel is its own separate channel. It has nothing to do with the base that was diverted from other speakers. And it should just be played as is. Because if you set the low pass filter for the LFE channel to anything lower than 120 hertz, you are actually losing that information. That information doesn't get diverted anywhere else. It just gets filtered off and goes away, <laughs> which is really weird. That low frequency yeah, effects. I don't even know channel, why they have. That I setting. don't know why they have it. It's it's. I don't. It, I don't it can know why only there. confuse people and get them to do it wrong. Now, I don't blame you one second. Everything logically yeah. seems like those two things should match. I, we're just here to tell you they don't. Leave the LPF for LFE at its default of 120. Don't touch it, and then put it out of your mind. Never even think about it again. We're only going to worry about the crossovers for the speakers. So that 80 hertz crossover that's specified, that is because with THX certified speakers, they have been designed. They will be minus 3 at 80. They will have a second order roll off below that. And all things being set up correctly absolutely should work with an 80 hertz crossover setting in your Denon receiver, which does itself apply a second order roll off of its own. That means when the second order roll off that was applied by the Denon cascades with the second order roll off that's built into your speakers, you end up with a perfect fourth order roll off, which is exactly how the whole THX crossover idea was designed and it, and it all works very swimmingly. The one little wrinkle in that is that if for some reason your room has a resonance or a suck out right around 80 right. hertz, <laughs> which, yeah. you know... Which is what we're going to get to in yes, a second that's, here. <laughs> that's exactly... But, you know, just to explain why, even though that's the way THX speakers were designed and even though that's what you were doing, why it still might not sound perfect with those recommended settings is because THX does not know your room ahead of time yeah. and it is very possible well, for your room to have a resonance right around that, that frequency of 80 hertz. And, and how could they? And, well, and sure. how could they? I they mean, had you could specify it, it, a room, but then they, they're not going to send police to make sure that you actually adhere to well, it. Well, and on top of that, they had to pick something, mm -hmm. right? Everybody had to pick something and say, okay, what is a reasonable place where we could start crossing over yeah. sub, uh, speakers into subwoofers where, it, you know, the, the, the base wouldn't be localizable and but speakers would still, you know, be reasonably cost effective mm -hmm. to make and, and be able to get down there. And 80 hertz is where... Where they sort of landed yeah now, like all of them you know we all sort of landed there because for a long time it was just you know we want all all the sound to come from one place mm -hmm. and everything needs to be full range speakers and then you know the speakers got absolutely ungodly big and <laughs> and <laughs> incapable and people were in, incapable of integrating them into their their mm -hmm. homes and they were like we need smaller speakers well if you need smaller speakers you we can't do the the other thing that we were trying to do and that was even before all the research was done right that shows how bass actually interacts in your room uh so his next question and we're we're kind of alluding to where this is going he says when we had when he had all the speakers crossed over and crossovers at, at the lf lpf or lfe both set to 120 mm -hmm. the system sounded less boomy and the bass sounded more centralized and uniform and better defined that wasn't what he expected given the thx recommendations so we can explain can we explain why that was the case and rob basically already explained it there is something going on with the room at that 80 hertz right. crossover uh at that 80 hertz level where the crossover is happening and for whatever reason because you know it is it is all these things happening at the same place 
it's giving you uh, not the best base experience. So what would be the solution? Mm -hmm. It would be to leave the, the well, I mean, the, take the LF, uh, LPF or LFE should be left at 120 no matter what. Yeah. And then you start adjusting this, the, the crossover both up. Well, in your case, you, get, you don't want to adjust it down. Some people may be able to adjust it down depending on what speakers they're running because you have thx speakers i would never recommend adjusting it down lower mm -hmm. than 80 hertz because the thx speakers are not designed to really play mm -hmm. that you know, like rob said there there's a a built-in crossover uh, a, a roll off there so you may want to adjust it up and it doesn't have to be all the way to 120 it may just be indeed bumping up to 100 gives you that same effect right so any you know in the uh, if 120 works for you and it sounded good I cannot, I, I can't believe that I have to keep saying this. And I feel like <laughs> people don't believe you when you do say it. If somebody says, somebody comes into a forum or onto Reddit or something like that and says, I have my system set up this way. It sounds really good to mm -hmm. me, but they say I should set it up this way. What should I do? Well, in this case, and he's answer, not even saying sounds really good. It's that he went with the recommendation, then right. compared it to a change and was like, the change sounds noticeably demonstrably better <laughs> so we can explain where yeah, we can explain to you he, why yeah, it he, is he's trying to understand why <laughs> but the reality is if it sounds better you should definitely leave it there you know, or at least experiment with it a little bit more uh but yes there is a suck out or a uh, a boomy because he said it sounded less boomy right yeah less boomy uh, so i mean you you i mean very uh un very probably like it's this is yeah. not a shock at all to have a standing wave or a resonance in your room because of the dimensions of your room that's what determines right. it the dimensions of your room uh that happens to be something close to 80 hertz maybe it's 85 or maybe it's 75 right. but you know it's something yeah. close in to that, that area in yeah. that vicinity and so i mean here's the thing we know he has four subwoofers spread around his right. room which means even if you didn't do things super carefully, it's hard to not have quite uniform bass with those four subwoofers getting, all playing together. And getting those those speakers who are not optimally placed for bass That's right. out of the equation and yep. letting just the subwoofers do it. Yeah. Is giving it that makes total sense if you have that a raising the crossover sounds better now, yeah, right, right there at 80 hertz yeah. or right around 80 hertz. So it makes perfect sense in your case yeah. why this might be the why this might be, yeah, because if we, and if we get away from THX certified speakers, where maybe we don't really know exactly how low they play all on their own and then bring them into the room and we know even less how they roll off on the bottom end, right, the experiment right, right. you can do is to just play a bass sweep through one speaker, just one speaker at a time, listen across your entire couch to, to hear what the uniformity is, and you'll very often discover that, oh, when I play a bass sweep through one speaker, because my speaker needs to be positioned where it needs to go for proper imaging. I, I, I can't help what the bass output from that one speaker is going to be. And as I move across my couch, it's like, you know what? It sounds good and linear and uniform in all three of my couch seats, all the way down to uh, about 160 hertz or something like that, you know? <laughs> and then below that, it starts to become non-uniform at my seats. And then, you know what? At 90 hertz or 85 hertz, I got this this complete silence of a null in one of my seats or this massive, you know, boost, this boom that happened in one of my seats. And all of that is completely dependent on the room. The speaker designer can't help any of that. And the solution right. is to do exactly what you have, have multiple subwoofers that can address the room problem. That's the only way you can do it. And then raise the crossover point between the speaker and the subwoofers, because now yeah. those subwoofers all playing together, they don't have that horrible non-uniformity and that or that boom at the 85 or 90 hertz frequency so they're playing that frequency better than an individual speaker can and you're crossing over the speaker higher to avoid that non-uniformity and the boominess that happens from that one speaker yeah. so it all adds up none of it is shocking but understanding it it does kind of go against the common wisdom right or or in fact i don't blame him this is what the manual said to do <laughs> it said yeah. set your darn crossover at 80 it's pretty hard to say oh you shouldn't do that i mean that's what the manual told him to do we can't blame him for that for one second so hopefully right. you better understand how they're not able to know what your room is going to do ahead of time mm -hmm. and that's that's the variable that you have now experimentally addressed and we've explained right it's it's funny because you went to that LPF or LFE setting and went, oh, 
I should adjust this and then start adjusting everything and got to someplace good. Yeah. Yeah. By doing things we would have told you not to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the fact that you got there anyways is great. And you ended up at where your L LPF or whatever this for LFV setting was where it should be. And then right. your crossover <laughs> right. was way higher than you, you thought it, you thought it should be. And it sounded really good. And, at some point in your brain, you must have been wondering about the L LPF for LFE and whether mm. or not that was the thing that was making the difference. And mm. it's good that we've had this discussion about it because it's uh, it's definitely, you know, there are some things in, in receivers that I just I just don't understand why they're still there. <laughs> like know. why why they even have these options yep. available anymore. Um, I mean... Yamaha is a perfect. And it's just not just Yamaha; it's all of them. But Yamaha is the, the the worst offender. It's just all the the Rock Arena and and oh, know. you know <laughs> they'll never get rid kettle, of it. That's their T, T shop. Sauce. You know DSP modes. I'm just like, who is who, like who is demanding these? Like who is calling you up saying <laughs> what happened to my mm -hmm. Rock Arena three? That was my favorite one. If they get one complaint, it's too many because they could have just left it. Mike, Mike is back with his wide open room where he wanted to get a pair of speakers that would let him and his wife enjoy music anywhere throughout the entire open space. We suggested the HSU CCB8 speakers. He was really impressed with what he read about them. So he placed an order and he's hoping they'll work out. Me too. If they don't, it's Rob's fault. He was True. considering getting a pair of SVS PC 2000 Pro cylinder subs, but we said we had no way to predict the best placement and we disagreed about whether we thought one or two subs would come in uh, would be the correct choice. Luckily, he has a pair of SB B2000 subs in his not quite finished home theater room so he's going to experiment by bringing those into the living room space and hopefully that will let him determine whether to get one sub or two and the best locations excellent well, it won't not help you do that that's for sure oh yeah so much better to have know. it and try it out so i'm in yeah. favor of all that so we remarked that uh, his room, other than the rug and his cat, there's not in his room, other than uh, the rug and his hat, there's really nothing absorptive in the entire space. He'd like to improve that at least a little if he can. First up, they found a larger shag rug that they like. We've said to put a, a thick pad as possible under the rug. The new rug is eight foot by 10 feet. But what pad should they get? A half inch thickness, about the thickest he's come across. Did we mention a pad that is a full one inch thick at one point? If so, where is that available? I never mentioned that. I I, mentioned I, that. I, I I genuinely can't remember when whether I did or didn't. Um, I, I, I don't remember you mentioning it. If, if I did, I probably talked about doubling up <laughs> a carpet pad or a rug pad because there are half inch thick for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I would like... In either case, even if it were one inch thick, which is a bit unwieldy to go under a rug, I mean, let's I'm going to trip over that. Yes. I'm going to trip over that every single day. Yeah, and I'm not doing. And it. I mean, you're in still going to trim this carpet uh, pad uh, beneath the rug so that you can have something to kind of stick down the edges of the rug so that you don't go flying on it and hurting yourself. So I mean, we're we're going to do that regardless. I mean, the half inch is about what's reasonable. In either case, as I was about to say, even if it were one inch thick, it's only going to be the highest frequency that get impacted by that at all but we're for anything anything at all that helps to absorb anything in this room because there's nothing else going on so get the half inch the felt for 70 bucks you can get an eight foot by 10 foot felt uh rug under pad for you know that's a half inch thick for off of amazon so 70 bucks isn't too bad and that's what i would do we'll have a link for one the wall behind the TV is about the only place you could put some absorptive panels. His wife would be fine with taking down the mirror on that wall. They look through Gix product offerings, and she liked the options in Gix Impression Series, and that's the one with the diffusion-ish panel. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, wood, panel. it's a wood pattern on top of the panel. That's what it yeah, is. It's, yeah. it's, it's not it's calculated very... diffusion or anything like that, but she liked the looks, so that's important. Yeah. <laughs> So he could get a four inch thick version of those and basically have them in place of the mirror looking like a decoration on that wall. But he wanted to ask, they are described as absorption diffusion combo panels. Is that because of the decorative wood panels uh, patterns on top of the insulation? The answer is yes. yes yep. Will that be okay in such a reflective room? Anything's better than nothing. It sure or is. should he insist on getting art panels that do not have the wood panels on the front? My dude, if your wife says she likes the one, that's the one you get. That's like full and stop. They're you're less done. expensive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that I would. There's no world in which I would care whether or not that diffusion panel was on top of that. Indeed, because yes. Anything is better than nothing, and yes, yes, it is. I would 
Yes. And yeah, I mean, Do the not four fall. inch. This is not the hill you die on, sir. <laughs> no, <laughs> the four inch thick uh, absorption. That's great. Go as thick as you possibly can. Cover as much of that wall as you possibly can get away with. Um, having the right. little bit of wood pattern on top of it. Like, again, sometimes people think diffusion somehow retains treble energy or something like that. No, it still reduces the treble energy too. Just not right. quite as much as absorption alone so i've got zero beef if your wife has okayed the looks of this do it do it as quickly as you possibly can before any minds are changed before she changed her mind yeah before she changed her mind you know if if you can go get away with four inches instead of two inches absolutely do that and it's it's worth every penny he says he could fit some additional two inch thick panels lower down on that same wall basically directly behind the tv and speakers should he do that uh, the answer to should I put a panel any place in this room is yes. Yep. And I really don't care where it is. Yep. Like it could be <laughs> as long as it's not covering an air vent. It's sure. like, yes, put it there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so yes, mm-hmm. you should do that. Agreed. In the corner next to the TV stand where they have a desk lamp right now, he could put a, in a super chunk as long as it's only as tall as a TV stand. Since that's pretty short, is it even worth doing? See response to previous question yep. <laughs> <laughs> we're for we're for anything and everything that's absorbed i feel like a tri trap is not that tall i mean they're like a little under four feet a little, well I feel that's still like... taller than that because i mean he's envisioning that it's even with really the top of the stand yeah oh yeah that's very short sorry yeah. sorry, sorry but still yes. do it okay if you can do it still do it, do it. So he says, is it okay to have a speaker or subwoofer nestled right up against an acoustic treatment, or does it need to be a certain distance from them? Yeah, just th- I, I, you could put it on, I, yes, put it on top of the, <laughs> the acoustic yeah. treatment, put the acoustic treatment oh, on yeah. top of it. Just don't, don't, don't try to uh, talk me out of letting you put more treatments in here. The answer to putting more treatments in here is yes, even if they're not optimally placed. Mm-hmm. The only time I will tell you not to put a, a treatment someplace in this room is if that treatment is in between you and a speaker. Like in sure. between your ears and a speaker. <laughs> that is the only time I'm going to say don't put a treatment there. Sure. But I would say... You can still put a treatment there if you hunt, cut out a hole so that the sound can come through to your ear. So, I mean, the only so. question is those CCB8 speakers, they are rear ported. And he has just talked about putting panels on the low part of the wall right behind those speakers. And HSU in their manual suggests having at least one and a half inches between the port and the wall. So right. I don't think that is going to be <laughs> the make or break on a- an inch and a half. Uh, I'm like, you want those speakers to be, you know, flush with the front of the uh, TV stand anyway. Right. So right, right. Th- that's the only one where I'll say, yeah, you probably don't want the port like literally shoved against the wall or the treatment just to like completely blocking the port. But HSU, they like uh, an inch and a half. That's all you need. So there, that 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 should put your mind at ease. <laughs> Kevin. Kevin asked, would it sound horrible if you turned a pair of tower speakers horizontal? I'll let that sink in for a second before I read mm-hmm. the rest of this question. Because because if you th- thought that was a weird way to start it, it's not going any place better from here. <laughs> he's just completing a garage makeover. It is not in any way a home theater. But there is a TV, and he's got a pair of tower speakers that he wants to use in there. He'd like to make sure the speakers are completely out of the way, though. So he was thinking he could secure, secure, secure them up high, close to the 11-foot ceiling, and have them horizontal. But he was reading online how there would be interference between the tweeter and the woofers and how if you walked left to right or vice versa, it would sound really bad. Is that true? Or is that maybe only the case in really directional speakers with horn tweeters or ribbons or something? What's the deal? Can towers go on their sides? So there is no world where I think that putting a tower speaker near the ceiling is a good idea, but you're going to do it anyways. And this is actually not the strangest thing (laughs) we've seen. (laughs) I've seen no. towers upside down. I've seen towers uh, hung from chains. Um, so what you're really worried about here, and I this right to left concern boggles so, I mean, my mind. I don't on really a completely, know where people came up with that. Well, right. On a completely technical level, 
you have, you know, if you have your tweeter and your mid-range driver or your woofers, there is, like, if you measure it, right, there in the right. region where the woofer crosses over to the tweeter, there is going to be some wave interference. Typically, it like, even in a two-way speaker, let alone one that has, you know, three or four bass drivers below it, right. the vertical dispersion is not going to be completely equal to the horizontal dispersion. Usually, we're going to see slightly wider horizontal dispersion and slightly narrower and- vertical dispersion version that's the one thing i would be concerned about with doing this is that your tower speakers just like any other speaker and Mm -hmm. i have an article about turning a bookshelf speaker on its side uh and whether or not you can do that to have it be a center channel Mm -hmm. and this kind of applies here uh you know, the the horizontal dispersion of a bookshelf or tower speaker is designed in a specific way so that it is wide not always, but often it is wider than it is tall. And that is so that, you know, it encompasses that couch. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you have to make a trade-off. So by turning the tower speaker on its side, Mm -hmm. you've now made its horizontal dispersion vertical and its vertical dispersion horizontal. So you may end up with a more beamy, speaker than you would have had had in you the not horizontal it. direction but right. he's talking about having these speakers mounted so high that i'm like having the wider now vertical dispersion isn't necessarily a bad thing also right. this is a garage <laughs> this Who is cares? a this is a garage yeah. i'm i'm like i'm so not worried about okay could somebody measure, and if you were critically listening, might you even notice if you were to have these tower speakers horizontal, and and let's assume that they do have more limited vertical dispersion than horizontal, because yeah. that's pretty typical, that's pretty normal. Uh, we probably could show that if you measure, like you're moving, sweeping the microphone left to right, uh, right, and taking that measurement, or just listening to it, moving yourself left to right, that you probably could hear a bit of that lobing effect, you know, the rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall, even some sort of like maybe beating, intermittent beating as you move across. That is a, like, I'm not going to say on a technical level that that's impossible. That is possible because of that sound pattern wave interference when you've turned the speaker horizontal. That is possible. I'm also not the least bit worried about it in a garage. Like, it's well, just what not, a, not One concern. assumes that this is a working garage, and that's why you want yeah, to have speakers of, in there, like, the way, full stop. Yeah. And out of the way, right? You don't want to, you don't want them to be bumped or, you know, damaged or, mm-hmm. I don't know, flying debris hit them. It suggests to me that you're just looking for music or some background. Yeah. I mean, or you have, loud. you have the TV on and you can hear what's on the TV at least. Yeah. yeah. You're, you know, like Rob said, could you in theory like hear the difference as you walked across the room? Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. In a situation where this is really just for, you know, background noise mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, ways of uh, listening to podcasts or music while you're working. Are you ever going to pay attention to that? I don't think so. And the fact that, it, like Rob said, it's up high, the yeah. you know making your horizontal dispersion vertical might not be such a terrible thing Indeed. because you are going to place them up there. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, then you kind of you know. I think we're we'll s- give them some of the concern was is he actually linked to an article that was going why like, talking about why you don't want to turn your speakers horizontal, and but they were talking about setting up a mixing studio or a dubbing stage. And in there, I have to agree, right? Like when you're making mission critical decisions about the mastering or mixing of an album or a movie, I would not set up my tower speakers horizontal next to the ceiling. I I would not do that. I would set up my mixing studio or my dubbing stage (laughs) differently than that. Yes. So, you know, like I'm not... You're not mixing music in this this garage. I don't really think you have any things things to to worry about. I think he was worried, like, they're saying, like, it's so bad, don't do it. And I'm like, for their application, I kind of have to agree. I don't want to make decisions about my final recording quality based on my speakers being positioned like that. But it's like, does that now translate to it's so bad that I can't use it for casual playback in the background of a garage? No, there, there's a, yeah. a, a great difference in degree there. So perfectly reasonable, uh, you know, wondering whether when they say it's so bad, don't do it, if it if it goes all the way to that level, and we're saying, no, not all the way to that level. No, I don't think so. Nathan, Nathan wants to mount a pair of speakers to a ceiling. Mm-hmm. Are they towers? These are <laughs> not. If not, 
<laughs> Either not. Their normal two-way bookshelf design, they weigh about 10 pounds each. They have a single mounting hole on the back and another single mounting hole on the bottom. He'd like to angle them at about 45 degrees, a degree angle from the ceiling. He's having a heck of a time finding an appropriate ceiling mount. The ones he's found uh, list 10 pounds as their maximum weight capacity, and their user review saying, good luck if you want to hold much weight, that much weight while relying on the ball joint they used to hold the, the speaker at an angle the way he wants to. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the speakers have mounting holes that are 3 8 inch diameter diameter and 16 thread count uh thread count uh, so that's no just 16, 16 threads thread. per inch right yeah, that's yeah it count it count is sheets <laughs> and it seems like all the speaker amounts are a quarter inch 20 thread he did manage to pull up a google search for omni mount pro for an omni mount product that might have checked all the boxes but it's discontinued and nobody has them for sale <laughs> So what the heck? Does he need to custom build something on his own? Or is there a ceiling, a speaker ceiling mount that we can point him to that will work? He did discover there are simple adapters to make quarter inch bolts into three eighth inch, but that still leaves the concerns about the weight capacity and ball joints. Any ideas? And I believe he, uh, I, I feel he is right to be concerned. I, I wouldn't really want to go with any of those ball joint style ones that are, you know, like uh, Monoprice. You have has to like them. torque them down like crazy to get them yeah, to stay. And and even they then. can crack because for the most part, they yeah, do have plastic. plastic parts. And yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of going with one of those. So uh, thankfully, there are heavy duty mounts. These are actually the ones that Fluant sells, but they're out of stock right now. <laughs> but mount it, uh, mount dash it.com has uh, these same heavy-duty mounts. They're not crazy priced. They're $22 for a pair, or in fact, they sell them as two pairs for only $32. So if you've got uh, you know more than just a pair of speakers, you can save yourself a little bit of money there. These are rated for, I think it's 35 pounds. Uh, you know, they're, they're rated for much, much more weight and, and should be no problem for yours. They are not a ball joint. They use a full, you know, screw down clamp that, that really holds things secure. And um, they actually come with like an additional cable to uh, make sure that even if one of those joints fails, the speaker is not going to fall. Uh, you'd have to pull out all four screws from whatever you put the base into to have the speaker actually fall down. So they're safer. They're much more secure. Um, yeah. And and not crazy overpriced. So we'll have the link to those. The The model name is the MISBO3, if you're looking it up, but we'll have the link right to it. Um, now, they sort of point out right in their thing that the uh, mounting bracket that it comes with, it is compatible with one hole, two hole, or a keyhole uh, mount on the back of the speakers. Um, what you can do is just go to the hardware store and get the thread size that you need. Uh, you know, that that's a, a small additional cost, but it's it's really quite easy <laughs> to do it that way. Uh, in fact, probably easier than the ones that are that are already pre-threaded for a certain size. So I think that checks all the boxes at a pretty darn reasonable price. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, I have a link. I, I should add that to my best speaker mounts yeah. for holes or ceiling article. Timothy, Timothy enjoyed our discussion about what makes a good speaker and what is appropriate for a two-channel setup versus surround sound and immersive audio. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't remember that. Well, that was yeah. We basically said it's, a, it's the same speaker across the board. We didn't think that oh. a two-channel speaker should be different from a surround speaker. That sounds like me. That sounds like us. But he would like to flip that discussion on his head and ask, "What is the main reason why a bad speaker sounds bad? Mm -hmm. Nonlinearity." <laughs> There you go. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's that would be the main it. reason. It that really would be the, is main, the reason. main reason. There, that is yes. pretty much it. You measure if it in an anechoic chamber. Bad. The <laughs> signal that you sent to the speaker said, hey, play all of these frequencies one after another, all at the same volume. And the measurement you get back in the anechoic chamber is not a flat line, a, a right. very noticeably not a flat line, right? If you've got all speakers have little squiggles, you know, they're not literally a flat ruler of a line coming back, but some speakers have pretty darn big peaks and troughs in that right. response. And when that's the case, uh, I mean, we, we would say it's objectively not doing the job that the tool should do. There were instructions sent to that speaker. The signal said, do this thing, and the speaker did not do that thing. It did something different. So objectively, it's just not doing what it was told, and I would call that a bad speaker. So he said he's, he's heard a lot of bad sounding speakers. Most of them were dirt cheap, but he's also never heard a clip speaker that he would put he wouldn't put in the bad category, <laughs> despite having owned some himself. Is the main reason just the frequency response, or is it distortion or transient response or something else that leads to a bad sound from a speaker? Okay, so 
if you're what we just said, nonlinearity is objectively a bad speaker. Mm. There is no, there is there is nothing else that, that to, to me everything else is is yes it can also make a speaker sound bad mm -hmm. but it's got to be linear before anything else right. you know i worry about any of the rest of that stuff um can you take a good speaker and make it sound bad mm. by poor setup you know uh, horrible mis room acoustics <laughs> mis mismatched uh, room versus speaker capabilities mm -hmm. poor amplification uh poor EQ. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like a lot of things you can do to a speaker uh, or a f uh, uh, or uh, do around a speaker that will make it sound bad. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, honestly, there's, you know, there's more things that you can do that make it sound bad than you can that make sure. it sound good. Well, and I mean, there's, so, there's the audiophile conundrum, which is right. I have this room and I brought in a smattering of different speakers, none of which are accurate and linear to the signal. Right. But it turns out that one of those speakers happens to have an inherent nonlinearity to it that when combined with my room that I have not acoustically treated is like a, a static EQ that I had no adjustment over, but it just happened to work out. Like that's the audiophile's dream because they right. only believe in matching equipment with other equipment to essentially form these static EQs that you have they, no adjustment over. They that, feel that, like, like audio is like being a chef. <laughs> oh yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, that they feel like you can, you know, it, it's not about buying the best ingredients and then you're done, mm. which is what we believe because, we, sure. <laughs> you know, then putting it in a good pot, which is kind of what we okay. believe. They and, believe and, and adjusting that the everything right makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. So he said this frequency response is a distortion. Distortion is also bad, but you can cause a speaker, a speaker to distort. Yeah. And also, by, I like, if we're talking harmonic distortion, it's yeah. got to get remarkably high before we actually notice it as a problem because but even even if harmonic distortion is audible in a speaker our brain tends to just interpret it as having gotten louder before like yeah. it has to get remarkably high before we we start saying oh that's bad distortion yeah. it, it's so that's that's not just, usually the thing that that if, if you've spent any time like trying to train your ear mm -hmm. or just trying to listen to music critically, you will at some point be in a situation like, you know, I had my son's graduation. You'll be in a situation where you're like, I am hearing bad sound right mm. now and nobody else around me is wincing like I am. Mm. But I'm wincing because I recognize it as being not good and, I, and I'm not really sure what's bad about it. And you realize it's distortion. You're hearing mm. speakers distort or something clipping or something's mm -hmm, going on mm -hmm. that is causing the sound to be not good. Mm -hmm. And that causes you to wince where everybody else is like, I don't know, it's just kind of, it's too loud. But even in I that wish they scenario, would turn very often... It's it's not even that. It is the, still the frequency response, and you, the mm -hmm. more trained listener, are noticing. Oh, that that treble is cranked way up or way down, and I'm missing a whole bunch of detail that I'm like, I really think that should be there, and nobody yeah. else notices. I mean, particularly if it's that something yeah. is rolled off, because that's hard to notice. It's hard to notice the absence of something you know, yeah. if you if you aren't familiar with with what it's supposed to be. It's really hard to notice the absence of something. Uh, but in the case of you know he he. He specifically pointed out Klipsch saying he, he hasn't heard a Klipsch speaker that he, he wouldn't have put in the bad category. Now, we've said all along, Klipsch doesn't aim for flat linearity. They have a sound. It is a pretty darn obvious smiley-faced curve most of the time yeah. with fairly tipped up treble and fairly tipped up bass. Um, but some there are some other like humps that they put in there on purpose. That's their sound. It tends to make voices very prominent and very forward in the mix. And it tends to make high frequency treble details stand out. You get those sibilant sounds and those plosive sounds and they're like exaggerated. But if that's what you really pay attention to and love, then some people really like it. So, you know, we aren't shocked if you are a person who's like, I want to A, see a flat line in my measurement graph and then hear, you know, a sweep and have all those frequencies completely even in volume. If that's what you want and then you listen to most clip speakers and go, well, they're not doing that. So I put them in the bad category. We're not shocked by that. We don't think that's crazy. <laughs> we would, we yeah. would agree with that. I will say... um, 
the reference premiere series and actually they have a brand new like second generation reference premiere series which from the early reviews is even like uh, it was remarked upon that the second generation reference premiere is probably the most linear measuring closest to linear measuring speaker that Klipsch has like ever put out it's still got a bit of a smiley face curve but it's right. it's not as pronounced as previous generations so maybe those will be closer to your liking but yeah I, I would lean on what's the main reason? It's mainly that frequency response. The other ones have to be pretty egregious to really notice it as a bad sound. Yeah, I, I never sat down and thought to myself, oh, the transient response of this right. kind of sucks. You know, and it's not that it, I, I don't, it, it hasn't happened yeah. or that it's a, I don't notice it. It's just that it's really hard to pick out yeah. and you don't really notice it until you're like comparing a speaker to another speaker. Yeah. Like you can tell when the, 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 the treble is tipped up. Sure. It's, it's very easy. Or to the bass that. Like is Rob, tipped up. <laughs> like Rob said, the, noticing the absence of something is yeah. almost, it's almost impossible unless you're listening to something that is a, that is very easy to, to, to pick it out, which would be like a, doing sweeps. When you listen to sweeps, you're like, okay, well, there's nothing there for a while. That was weird. And then, it, you know, the, the speaker comes back. Um, yeah, so you know, personally, and, and I want to kind of go back to the Klipsch thing. Yes, objectively, mm. Klipsch is not trying to go for a flat frequency response. Neither is Bang & Olufsen, neither is B&W, neither is a ear. whole yeah. golden ear, a whole bunch of other pl mm -hmm. places either. They have a signature sound that people like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, I have absolutely no problems with it. And actually, I have no problems with people liking it. If that I'm actually kind of glad it exists, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know, it gives people a... a, a an, an option that gives, gives them right. something that they can listen to that either is good for their room, good for their ear, good for their hearing. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we used to walk through Cedia and we'd walk by the Macintosh booth, which mm -hmm. would be way out in, the, out in the middle of a huge auditorium, you know, you know, conference room thing. I mean, not like like in a hotel, I'm talking about a warehouse and there would be these massive speakers and we would be 30 feet away from them. And we're like, <laughs> that is a lot of trouble. <laughs> from right. here that is a lot but you know that's a speaker that is meant to to really accentuate some of those high high notes for people who can afford those speakers and maybe can't hear so well up, up at that range so there is you know they're having these options out there is not necessarily a bad thing and i don't blame people for liking clip speakers not at all they get them home they live with them and they're like this is what good sounds like mm -hmm. because i haven't heard bad you know <laughs> or i haven't heard other things mm -hmm. either and i'm not going to because i'm not buying any more speakers mm -hmm. this is what i bought i spent a lot of money on these things and i'm happy with them and then you know having somebody like that go onto a a, a forum and say hey my center channel broke i need to i need to get another one which one should i get mm -hmm. for my clip speakers you should burn all your clip speakers okay <laughs> Maybe not the most helpful advice mm -hmm. we've ever heard, but uh, yeah, I think it's great that they, that uh, there's these different options out there for Absolutely. you. Oh, thank you. I my completely phone's agree. Hopefully, it's not my wife calling me. Brian, how much time do we have left here? Uh, we, Brian's last. About, uh, Brian has a p. A, a Brian has a gaming PC with a AMD 6900 XT GPU. It can run most games on his PC. Monitor at max settings with 4 4 4K resolution and 120 frames per second or more mm -hmm. look at you go twitch streamer uh he decided to hook it up to his home theater system for some giant screen gaming he uses a jvc nx7 projector so it tops out at 4k 60 he got brand new high speed premium hdmi cables from monoprice and plugged his pc into his onkyo tx nr787 receiver which is then connected to his jvc no matter what setting he tried he can't get 4k to pass through his computer always bumps his settings back down to 1080p his 4K video sources work, and obviously his PC can do more than 1080p, so what is the problem here? He's made sure HDMI CC is turned off in every device, and his PC recognizes his Onkyo under its output display options, so he's hoping we know about some setting that will get 4K working in this setup. The only thing I can think of off the top of my head is that he's got like the max color setting or whatever that's sucking up all the bandwidth or something so what, what you got <laughs> yeah so uh the issue in this and i had to do a little bit of research and at least i can convey that um brian and i actually uh connected on twitter uh just uh, yesterday just before i was doing the topic list and that um 
so we were able to test out <laughs> what I'm proposing as the solution, and uh, and I can report uh, as a spoiler alert, we have a happy ending to all of this. So that's the good news, and to go through what this was. Um, because we've got three variables here, right? We've got the settings inside the PC, we've got the settings in the JVC projector, and we've got the Onkyo sitting in between them. And my first suspect was, in my mind, I remembered that Onkyo receivers have some hidden settings. They aren't just in the typical user menu. These are like, hold down a button on the front panel while pressing oh, another button on the front panel, and there's like a secret you know, menu or setting. Uh, the only one of which that is mentioned in the manual is a full factory reset. A full factory reset is performed that way. That's pretty common, and that is in the user manual. But none of these other ones were. So I had to go look it up, and I had to know to search for, like, Onkyo hidden menu or Onkyo right. secret menu. Because he, he mentioned in his email, he's like, I, I tried looking up this problem, you know, GPU limited to 1080p, and he's like, I, I couldn't find anything. He's like, this seems like the first time I couldn't find anybody else talking about this issue. But once I was like, go look for, you know, Onkyo hidden menu, that then similar things showed up. And sure enough, there is a, like, hidden menu setting where on Onkyo receivers of his model year or newer, uh, they have individual buttons on the on the front panel of the AV receiver itself. This is not on the remote control, importantly, because some people tried it holding down these buttons on the remote control and nothing happened. This is on the front panel of the AV receiver itself. Uh, the Onkyos have all of the inputs uh, as separate buttons. So on these ones, you hold down basically whatever the first input is. On most of them, that'll be the BD DVD input. On some of them, that first button is actually the Zone 2 button. <laughs> but it's you can find a mention of this in Onkyo support, but you got to go digging for it. And you got to go know what terms to search for. So you hold down that first input button on the front panel itself, and then you press the standby button, which is not the... Le like that's the least intuitive thing you might want to press but you press the standby button and when you do that there is an hdmi 4k hidden menu that switches between standard and enhanced which is like a normal setting that shows up in yamaha and denon receivers to choose between 4k standard bandwidth and 4k enhanced bandwidth but for some crazy reason on the onkyos it's in this hidden menu and even crazier the default is standard limiting you to 10.2 gigabits per second not 18 gigabits per second that you need for 4k uh 60 with hdr you you need that premium high speed 18 gigabits per second and this is the only way to do it on the onkyo receivers now we went through that i was pretty darn sure that that was the problem but he tried it when we did it on twitter and he's like i didn't like Literally nothing came up on the front panel. It didn't say 4K, you know, HDMI 4K, let alone let him change between standard and enhanced. Nothing happened. And then he's like, so he tried holding other input buttons and pressing the standby button. And unfortunately, one of those just like did a full factory reset. It didn't even <laughs> say confirm. It's just like, nice. nope, you hold those two buttons and we're doing a factory reset right Don't now. sit on the remote. <laughs> well, the remote it's wouldn't the have mattered. Oh, right. But, so he w he went and accidentally factory reset his Onkyo, so he was a bit bummed about that. However, that got it to automatically check for a new firmware, and there was a new firmware. Oh, and after the firmware update had completed, he was able to hold down the BD DVD button, press the standby button, and the HDMI 4K hidden menu came up. He set it to enhanced, and it worked. So... <sighs> That's the happy ending to the story. I think it's ridiculous for this menu to A, only be accessible this way, and B, not be mentioned anywhere in the manual. And you have to know what you're searching for to find it in their support documents, which is ridiculous because if you don't know it's... why you have the problem, how would you know the terms to search for? So I'll have the link to the instructions for other people. This is something that other people have mentioned on Reddit, in YouTube videos, in fact, I might have a YouTube video to one person who did it in like a nice little short video just to show you how to do it and what it looks like. Uh, but also, you need your firmware up to date. <laughs> so, a bit ridiculous. I'm glad that's all it was, though. Uh, it's almost like Ankyo wanted us to get more listeners, so <laughs> they did this, made this stupid secret thing. 
Just for yeah, us, it's Rob. bizarre. It's just for us. It's, Who's yeah. left? Uh, so I've got Jonathan on the list. Uh, he didn't even super duper have a question, but it's kind of a double checking of a whole thing that he went through. So that's okay. what will be first up next week. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank George and Dan for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and sending us a PayPal donation, as well as our 143 patrons over at patreon.com. For sure, George and Dan, thank you both very much for those PayPal donations. Really appreciate that financial support. And then also supporting us financially are our 143 patrons over at patreon.com slash avrantpodcast. That's the address to go to if you'd like to sign up to also make an automatic monthly donation. I want to thank Dan for off for sending me his Harmony Remote Plus Hub uh, to give to my parents, and which I have not done yet, but I will do very soon. It is it is here. I have it. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you, Dan. That's like super generous. So that's yes, that's it wonderful. Really is. Hooray! And we've got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from Dale, David, Kevin, Andrew, and Gurinder. Yes, indeed. Dale, David, Kevin, Andrew, Gurinder. Thank you all so much for sending in those notes of gratitude and notes of encouragement. They're definitely appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. For A.V. Rant, I'm Tom Andrew. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.